Welcome back to part two of this video series featuring Lee Kuan Yew's view of the world. Let's get straight into it. Although Lee was critical of many of the US's policies and military occupations, he was never one to write them off, believing that they will remain a dynamic economy for decades to come, saying that his ability to draw in and retain top talent around the world sets it apart from any other nation. I think for the next 50, 100 years, the most dynamic economy in the world is America. He contrasts this against China, which he believes will find it harder to attract top global talent due to the language being extremely difficult to learn, combined with a current lack of soft power, where US media, television, and movies still dominate the global scene. However, he did warn that America can't be complacent. I think they will catch up, if not 10, 15, if not 15, 20 years from now. And maybe the catching up may be faster. Four times the size of America, they produce about two and a half million engineers a year who will go to any part of the world they are told to. A contest is an economic contest and the Americans do not realize that if Congress does not get out of this growth protections mode and no outsourcing, which was the position they took during the election campaign because it won them votes, the union votes, then I see uh, huge problems ahead. The wish of the Americans to remain a sole superpower, I think is. They may remain for 50 years, maybe 60 years. By the end of this century, it will be a multipolar world. He also contrasts the difference in entrepreneurial cultures, with America having a system where entrepreneurship is allowed to thrive, pointing to the creation of the iPhone and internet, whereas other countries like the UK are more rigid with a class system, where everyone knows their place. But he also acknowledges the price the Americans pay for this culture, which is the extreme inequality in the country. You don't find beggars, you don't find... Uh... Uh, half-starving people sleeping in doorways or in, under the bridges or whatever. I mean, we, 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 it, it offends the whole society. More relevant to today, he also warned about the decline of the US dollar status as the global reserve currency, saying that if the US continues down the path of money printing and deficits, combined with unbearable social security and Medicare costs, inflation will rise and confidence in the US dollar will plummet. But the 21st century will be a contest for supremacy in the Pacific. To, to hold that ground in the Pacific, you must not let your fiscal deficits and your dollar come to grief. The financial community, the bankers and all the hedge funds and everybody come to a conclusion that you're not going to tackle these deficits and they begin to move their assets out. That's real trouble. There's always the Federal Reserve, they'll make more money. Yeah. No, you no, can't do that. They just print more money. They will print more money. And your interest rates burden will grow with it. You are indebted in a different way from other countries. Other countries borrow US dollars or pounds and they got to pay back. You owe yourself US dollars. So you are under no pressure to pay back. But you are under pressure from such a huge amount of currency floating around that you get inflation. In the long term, you believe that the US needs to sort out the infrastructure, education system, growing class divide, persistent racial discrimination, and an electoral process that is too dependent on money and personality. America has been a hotbed for Chinese looking for better opportunities ever since the gold rush in the 1800s. However, in this question by a young scholar back in 2009, she asked Lee about his thoughts on young Chinese looking to move abroad to the US. In short, the grass is greener on the other side. Okay. No way. Unless we give him a contract. I see. We have to give him the freedom of choice. Some go to the United States for a few years, and they know that this is not a Chinese society, it's not a Chinese society. Some will come back. They are willing to go. Indeed, many of China's leading entrepreneurs studied or worked in the US before returning to China after spotting massive billion dollar opportunities in their home country. And it's not just the Chinese. Even born and bred Americans are leaving the US for countries like Japan and Korea, citing safety and affordability reasons. With the current slowdown in Chinese growth, contrasted with the increasing US-China tensions and the associated rise of Asian hate crimes, time will tell how this all plays out. Li had enormous admiration for the quality of Chinese leadership, which I've covered in my previous video, seeing the country transform enormously since his first visit in 1976. I visited China in 1976. Even then, I had a premonition 
of their tremendous brain power. The China I visited in 1976 was dilapidated, down, uh, gray, drab, everybody in the same Mao jackets. I was put up in the best hotel in Shanghai, I went down at night after dinner to see what it's like. And dark streets, unlighted shops, and whole streams of people. Oh, you go to Shanghai, Guangzhou, Dalian, Tianjin, all the coastal cities. Tremendous improvements in their infrastructure. Given the diversity of the country, the progress is made is quite outstanding. In fact, Singapore has helped China on a number of initiatives and projects, including the joint China-Singapore Suzhou Industrial Park and the Sino-Singapore Tianjin Eco City, with Li being one of 10 foreigners awarded the China Reform Friendship Medal after his death in 2018 for outstanding contributions to China. Although Li believed China could have a peaceful rise, he warned their leaders that the young generation was being instilled with too much pride and patriotism too quickly. In this clip, he recounts a story from 2004, where Singaporean leaders were branded as traitors on Chinese forums after visiting Taiwan. When the Deputy Prime Minister, our Deputy Prime Minister, who is now Prime Minister, went to Taiwan, the barrage of vicious articles on him on the internet from young students was intense. Suddenly, from a good old friend, he became a brand new enemy. Overnight, if you you say we are old friends, then we have to stay old friends for a long time. You can't say, suddenly I do something which you don't like and we become an enemy. I have no doubts that they will have a peaceful, they want a peaceful rise, this generation. But the grandchildren may think that they have already arrived and then they begin to flex their muscles and then you will have a very different China. So I. I put this question to them, they said, no, no, it won't happen. We'll tell them, we'll tell them, teach them all the lessons. You know, the grandchildren never listen to grandfathers. <laughs> <laughs> However, Li believed that a more assertive and nationalistic China would not be able to flex their muscles too much, stating that this is now a multipolar world and that the more they push their neighbors, the more likely they will to build closer ties to the US but also warned that peace and stability in the region will also depend on how Japan, US, and Europe decide to engage with China. There are thousands of Amer ch bright Chinese students as in America. You give them a bad impression, a bad time, they'll go home nursing a grievance. You accept them as friends and say, look, this is one world, global warming. We will be in trouble, you will be in trouble. AIDS, terrorists, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons. It's a different world. It is still in the formative stage. And if I were America, Europe, and Japan, I would spend time to make sure that the mindset of the younger generation is not one of hostility. In the long term, Li believed that China needs to sort out the wealth disparity between the coastal and inland cities, the inefficiency of state-owned enterprises, and making the transition from an export-driven economy to a domestic-driven economy. They want to maintain stability and economic growth, also stating that China will one day regret not reversing the one-child policy earlier. Hopeful sign that there is deep thinking at the top and a desire to find a peaceful way for themselves to grow. But whether that will be achieved, I don't know. Although Li didn't predict Britain leaving the European Union, Li did say that the European Union would likely fail. He also stated that the Euro would not survive in its present form, with the differences in economies between the multiple countries being too vast to manage under one currency. In the future, he believed that they could unite, accept fiscal integration, and operate under one Federal Reserve to become a world power, or more likely, a partial or messy breakup of the Eurozone, where everyone goes back to their own currency. Besides this, Li believed that Europe had a number of other underlying problems, including its lacklustre economy, believing they have gone too far with the welfare state and rigid labour market laws. Li had always believed that too much welfare has a negative effect on the individual's motivation to strive. If you want a society which is that compassionate, where everybody is entitled to the same social benefits when they are unemployed and so that nobody needs to, to be in want, then you are not going to have a competitive society, which means you won't have a productive 
economy. Though many commentators have pointed out the success of the Scandinavian economic model, where safety nets paid by the government hasn't led to economic decline, Lee believe that Scandinavian exceptionalism is mostly due to their small size and homogeneous population, which has led to social cohesion where everyone feels a sense of community, where the poorest in society want to contribute and help others, and the richest in society willing to pay high taxes for the benefit of everyone else. However, like in other parts of Europe, he believed in the possibility that the Scandinavians would eventually be less willing to support lower income groups, with the increase in refugees and migrants in the country, pointing to the social, racial and religious tensions seen in Germany and France. But despite the rhetoric from increasingly right-wing politicians, Europe has no choice but to let in immigrants to meet domestic needs. In the long term, Lee believed Europe will have an increasingly small voice on the international stage. The other Europeans will realise that Yes, they need the Americans against contingencies in other parts of the world and in case Russia becomes aggressive once again. And even the British over time will find themselves more Europeans than they really want to be. A quick note on Lee's thoughts on Russia. Though he had friendly relations with Russia's leadership, having been awarded with Russia's Order of Honour, Lee believed that the country would unlikely confront the West militarily, given their poor economic situation. But you also said in this speech that I read that their capabilities of Russia are limited. Well, they've got enormous uh, a nuclear arsenal. But what else? Their army is uh, a very different army now. And their population is declining. Alcohol, uh, drugs, and pessimism. Every year, more Russians die than Russians are born. Lee praised Filipino people as being incredibly artistic and creative, even more so than Singaporeans. And that is a shame that so many leave the country for better opportunities abroad, stating that they should be one of the more successful ASEAN countries. However, Lee described the Philippines as having a soft, forgiving culture, stating that only in the Philippines could a leader like Ferdinand Marcos, who pillaged his country for over 20 years, could still be considered for a national burial, and that his wife and children are allowed to return and engage in politics. In this video, all the way back from 1992, Lee advised the steps the country should take to achieve a more prosperous future. To recap, first, restore law and order. Make Manila safe from organized kidnapping and major crimes. Second, concentrate on economics, not politics. Politics is not simply elections with singing and fiestas and giveaways, but that it is about their lives, their jobs, their wages, their homes, schools for their children, hospitals, lift restrictions on trade and investment, dismantle the web of measures which keep out foreign companies and make Philippine companies compete to survive, not thrive at the expense of the ordinary Filipino. Third, build up your infrastructure like power stations, roads, communications. Then you will get yourselves back into the mainstream of growth and development and be in the same league as Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. The OECD calls them now the new dynamic economies of Asia. You can be and should be one of them. Thank you. With the recent election of Marcos' son, Bong Bong, as leader, time will tell if the nation can reach its potential. So no one's surprised here. Lee always believed that Malaysia's race-based politics and pro-Malay policies place the country at an enormous disadvantage, stating they are prepared to lose a huge pool of talent in order to maintain the dominance of one race. Lee held great importance in having a peaceful, multiracial, and multi-religious society, so much so that he decided to separate Singapore from Malaysia in 1965, breaking down in tears following the decision. You know, it's a people connected by geography, economics, and ties of kinship. Would you mind if we stop for a while? Because <laughs> what we wanted was equal citizenship with special rights for the Malays. What they wanted was a Malay Malaysia. Malays form one party, Chinese and Indians form separate parties confined to racial groups. We could not accept that because that means 
perpetual division. Cut off Singapore, and the Malays become an automatic majority. It was a painful decision. Right or wrong, we had to make it. I cannot say that it was right. I thought there was no choice to avoid bloodshed, so here we are, we made the best of it. But we left a lot of very unhappy people behind, whom we had galvanized. And I bear that burden to this day. With a brain drain percentage larger than the global average, Lee has not missed the many success stories of Malaysian Chinese and Indians that have settled abroad, such as Penny Wong, Australia's current Minister for Foreign Affairs. In the end, he didn't believe that Malaysia will change regarding its policies, given the entrenched privileges and discrimination. Although Lee criticised Suharto's failure on nepotism and corruption, he stated if it wasn't for his decentralised control, Indonesia would be in a situation similar to Myanmar, given how diverse the country is with as many islands and ethnic groups. However, he was somewhat pessimistic about Indonesia's long-term ability to fix its issues on corruption and infrastructure without a strong central authority, saying that although Indonesia will have solid economic growth from its natural resources, it is unlikely to make huge strides stating that the population is developing too much of a laid-back culture as they become more and more reliant on digging up natural resources. With a huge population of 240 million people and a litany of billion-dollar unicorns and overseas investors, Indonesia's economic growth rate over the past decade has lagged regional neighbours, Philippines and Vietnam. Time will tell if they can reach their full potential. Lee predicted that Thailand should do well economically after the reforms former Prime Minister Thaksin implemented before his exile. Although Thaksin was a billionaire businessman, he implemented policies that benefited the poor, upturning the political status quo, which was dominated by wealthy elites and army generals, even predicting that Thaksin could make a return to Thailand in the future. In the end, Lee predicted Bangkok's elite, generals, and monarchy will have no choice but to share power with the progressives, as the population no longer accepts their monopoly on power after the improved standards of living under Thaksin's policies. With the popularity of the progressive parties growing stronger, time will tell if compromises can be made. Although Lee has never visited North Korea, he predicted the current regime will eventually implode, stating that if a country operated by a cult leader decides to open up to the world and adopt free market reforms, the population will quickly realise they've been scammed and revolt. Lee also believed that there is unlikely to be a reunification anytime soon between the Koreas, for a variety of geopolitical, economic, and cultural reasons. But I don't see reunification anytime soon. The Chinese have helped them to survive because they don't want them to implode. If they implode, the South takes over, you have a pro-American Korea. Yeah. And that brings American troops up to the Yalu River. So what they want is a North Korea still extant, but without the bomb. But why should the North Koreans listen to Chinese guarantees and give up the bomb? That's a problem. On South Korea, Lee believed that their economy would continue to grow as a result of their willingness to plug themselves into China's economy, with Koreans making up the largest foreign student population in China. South Koreans are the biggest student population in China now. Biggest student population in China? Yeah, because their parents are opening companies there and they got to understand the Chinese psyche and the language and the network. He further stated Koreans are hardworking, industrious, and are the toughest people in the region, but warned them to keep an eye on their low birth rates and that their government needs to move towards a model of greater consensus instead of the constant fighting and bickering between political parties, particularly in policies regarding the powerful Chaebols. In the 1960s, Lee praised Hong Kong's economic model as a leading example for Singapore, given it was also a former British colony with little natural resources and land. And in this 1992 speech, five years before Hong Kong was handed back to the mainland, he said that whatever happens politically, Hong Kongers are an extremely independent and self-reliant people that will thrive. He advised them to keep their international linkages and keep learning English, so not to be too reliant on the mainland's economic performance and to maintain an advantage over competing cities like Shanghai. However, in 2013, he acknowledged that these advantages were slowly being whittled away as Hong Kong becomes more integrated with the mainland. He also warned that Hong Kongers will never be able to influence the mainland politically and that they should just learn to live with each other and focus on doing business. Within those limits, you can thrive and prosper. The Chinese leaders have shown that they are not unhelpful. If I were a Hong Konger, what would I do? I said then that if Hong Kong offered opportunities 
for growth, prosperity, business, I would stay. But if it didn't, I would leave. And what Hong Kong was led to believe it, it wanted in the last few years of Chris Patton and after Tiananmen is what the leaders in Beijing cannot give. Anything you do here in Hong Kong which does not disturb or can become an example of what China should do, that they are prepared to allow. But anything that will encourage people in Shenzhen or Guangzhou and then up the coast to try and say, yes, yes, you know, like the Middle East, we have elections in Iraq, elections in Beirut, uh, elections overthrown in uh, Ukraine. That is not likely to win uh, enthusiastic support. If I were a Hong Konger today, I'd stay and do business. And I think you can do good business. Hong Kong deserves democracy. But alas, in the world as it is, we do not often get what we deserve. Lee stated that the Middle East is a beautiful place to visit and believed that many nations in the region would gradually move to a society that is more open, pointing out former King Abdullah's policies and reforms for women. He even floated the idea of reviving the Arabic language among the 10,000 or so Singaporean Arabs to improve business linkages between Singapore and the Arab world. But he warned the oil states that they will have to adapt quickly once their natural resources run out, stating that the population could grow complacent because of their excessive oil wealth. However, his biggest concern for the region was its volatility, particularly the Palestine-Israel conflict, stating that if the Americans can demonstrate a neutrality and greater seriousness in seeking a two-state solution, they will find it easier to get support from the Arab states. However, Iran could also prove to be a major barrier to peace, predicting that they could eventually obtain nuclear weapons, which would increase the possibility of a serious miscalculation in nuclear war. That I have got to, for the next generation of Israelis, yeah. I have got to find a way to True. peace. Absolutely. Because an armed... Otherwise, it's endless wars or tensions and the terror. danger eventually of a Holocaust. In a conflict between Israelis and Arabs and Muslims, rationality dissolves. And fear takes over. Yes. Unfortunately, Lee believed that this conflict is an unsolvable problem. Despite the many advancements in Lee's lifetime that was enabled by globalization and technology, he also acknowledged that there were many negatives, particularly increasing inequality, where talented people are able to move and make a good living in all parts of the world, whereas less skilled workers will find themselves increasingly replaced or outsourced, warning governments that they need to find a balance between CEOs getting paid their ridiculous bonuses versus helping those at the bottom maintain a decent standard of living. However, one of the more subtle predictions Lee made was the potential loss of identity and culture as a result of the internet, believing that young people would feel lost with the barrage of information and media they consume every day at their fingertips, with everyone now able to compare their lives to others on a global scale. In this interview, back when the internet was called the information superhighway, he makes a few points on this. The world becomes one integrated whole. This means a diffusion of jobs all over the world restructuring of the economies of the developed world and even the semi-developed world. So unless we keep on moving ahead, we will be suddenly relegated. What are the, the cultural implications of this information superhighway uh, that you've uh, mentioned? Well, it means unless you're careful in bringing up your young so that you don't lose your own bearings, your sense of place in this world, who you are, what you are, continuity with what you represent, your, your culture, your family, your values, uh, you'll become ruthless. In the end, he believed that this pace of change cannot be stopped, and that it's the individuals and nations who adapt the quickest who will pull ahead. Lee was a big proponent of keeping Singapore green and clean, launching multiple campaigns since the 1960s to transform Singapore into the garden city we know today. Based on the arguments he's seen, he disagreed with the climate deniers that the increase in Earth's temperature is part of a normal cycle, and he had deep concerns for the survival of humanity if nations refused to find a way to cut down carbon emissions. 
Short-term solutions, he proposed, include shale gas, but he predicted that more countries will adopt nuclear power into renewable energy like solar becomes economically viable. Every country will have to consider nuclear power because if you have a completely carbon-based economy, earth warming will become a dangerous climatical change for everybody with rising sea levels. Can it be managed after the fearful events at Fukushima? Yes, I think it can. And it must, because there's no other choice. Mine may be a minority view at present. But you look at the alternative. Burn all the coal. Burn all the oil or gas. Warm up the earth. Sea levels rise. Inundates big cities like Shanghai, Calcutta, all the, even New York will be at risk. And Singapore, definitely. US and China are trying to do the same, to have nuclear-powered submarines that can stay under the ocean for years without detection. And they produce their own water and their own oxygen, recycled. Now, if they can make nuclear machines, power machines, that's safe for a group of 150 people or more in, outer, in a submarine. It is not beyond the imagination of man to make it safe for multiples of that number. That's my belief. Another long-term solution was that as women become increasingly educated, the world's population will naturally decline and put less burden on the earth. This earth can only hold so many people. It's six million, six billion now, it'll be nine billion in 50 years. You keep on doing that and uh, you destroy all the biodiversity, you destroy all the forests. That just isn't the standing room and you've got to grow more food and plus earth warming. You add to it and we've destroyed our habitat. How do we stop that? I think you've got to start educating all the women in all the countries so that they become educated, they get jobs and they don't want to be just producing children. The sooner we do that, the sooner we'll have a less populated world. In the end, Lee believed that the current generation has a responsibility towards their children and grandchildren to pass on to them a world full of hope and vitality, just as it was passed on to us. And finally in this clip, we come full circle back to Singapore, where he describes his fears and worries for its future. Do you worry a bit though that Singaporeans, because of all this prosperity, are becoming a bit soft? No, not soft. They are becoming self-centered. Or taking for granted what no, you... No, they are hard-working, hard-driving, enjoy life, travel, have a good time. They are not going soft. You have said, with respect, that they, they don't feel the spur in their hide. <clears throat> That's because they don't think it's necessary to strive anymore. So we're already here. We have arrived. Our standard of living won't go down. Just leave it. And so what's your message to them when they say that? This needs more than an autopilot. Yeah. You run into storms. You run into air pockets. And the pilot and his co-pilot and the spare pilots must be on board and passengers must be alive and awake and alert. I sense you're worried. I'm worried because if we, if they rather, the new leaders and the population as a whole, do not realize the small base on which this is built and they take liberties with it, we could go down quickly. Spiral down, a vicious circle down. Quickly? Yes. 